Miles Teller to star in an Officer and the Gentleman remake. Uh, Blade lost another director. Emily Blunt circling Steven Spielberg's UFO movie. Sony has purchased the Alamo Draft House. And of course, the box office. All of that and more on this week's episode of the Movie Nights Roundtable. Hello, my friend. How are you? How are you, my friend? Good, good. We said how at the same time, and it freaked me out. But uh, <laughs> Another week, another batch of movie news. Yes, and something's going to come out tomorrow in between us posting this, and it's going to really outdate the news immediately. We love when that happens. Yeah, we're talking about Blade losing a director, and tomorrow they're going to be like, hey, it's Martin <laughs> Scorsese, and we're going to be like, oh, shit. <laughs> Look Absol- at us. <laughs> Absolutely. Yes. But uh, but guys, we have a hell of a show for you guys today. But before we dive into our news stories, uh, we want to do a couple things. One, on the last episode, when we read off some hot takes, we had said, hey, leave some of your hot takes in either these comments or in the next community post. So we have some more hot takes to go through. And these also come from Snarky McCarthy. Mm-hmm. I'm going to rapid fire these because he, he put a ton of stuff in there. All right. Let's do it. Ready? Let's do it. Dave Bautista is the best wrestler turned actor, and he is the more versatile than Dwayne Johnson and John Cena. I don't even consider that a hot take. I think that's slowly becoming reality for everyone. I think that's everyone. accurate. Now, if we're talking comedy, I think John Cena takes the cake there. I'll give you but that. But just in terms of general actor, Dave Bautista, hands 100%. down. 100%. Uh, the Star Wars sequel trilogy did not need a plan, but all scripts should have been finished and approved before filming Force Awakens, or the scripts for each should have been approved before making a release date. Yes and no. Mm-hmm. I feel like approving the scripts is part of a plan. Mm-hmm. So I think you don't get one without the other. Um, even if you, they didn't want to have like a cohesive three storyline, which I still am of the mind they should have, mm-hmm. approving the scripts in a way is a plan because then that allows people to be like, hey, actually, no. Because I feel like it wouldn't be approved unless there was a plan. So I think you don't get one without the other, what personally. I think, I think the biggest issue was it was I would even say that they did have the plan and the scripts approved, but after the response to Last they Jedi, shifted. they they shifted really quickly yeah. and then episode nine ended up becoming eight and nine yeah. to try to get rid of eight. By the way, if you've never read the script for Duel of the Fates, which has leaked and I do have, it's so good. <laughs> it's a really good script. Now that doesn't automatically mean the movie would have been great, yeah. but the script I enjoyed. I enjoyed greatly. Um, also continuing here, moving on, or more Star Wars. I wholeheartedly agree with this one. Uh, Ray should have stayed Ray Nobody, and that is far more emotionally and thematically compelling and satisfying. I 100% agree. I've always Ray been Team Ray Nobody. Star Wars. <laughs> Ray Star Wars. <laughs> I actually, on the way over to record today, I was listening to um, Daisy Ridley was promoting her new movie, uh, Young Woman in the Sea. Yes. Uh, she was on the Smart List podcast, Sean Hayes, Jason Bateman, Will Arnett. And Sean Hayes is a big Star Wars fan. He was talking about it, and she was he was like, oh my God, like I would love like, she was like, oh, yeah, like, I'll see if I can get you to set, like, mm-hmm. for the Ray movie mm-hmm. that they're working on, which she did not give any details of on. Of course. She said it takes place in the far future and that it might film next year, which I thought was interesting. Yeah. Um, but she was telling this story of she's like, I get hesitant bringing people to set because, you know, you're an actor, you're filming, you kind of get wrapped up in things. She goes, and I'm good friends with Josh Gad, who's a huge Star Wars fan. <laughs> so I bring him to set, and it's the day we're filming the scene where it's revealed that I'm Palpatine's granddaughter. And he's just, like, dead-eyed staring at me like, you've ruined my life. <laughs> like, now I know this information. That's so hilarious. But, yeah, I think she should have stayed nobody. Yeah, 100%. Long-winded way of saying that. Yeah. Um, two more, or three more. Mm-hmm. Uh, piss off Space Jam. The Looney Tunes Lola Bunny is Lola Bunny. I feel like I'm missing something there. I, I take it he doesn't like the Lola Bunny from Space Jam? The new Space Jam. The Zendaya Lola Bunny. Sure, I don't I th- know. I think he's a fan of the Michael Jordan Lola Bunny. I, I don't know what you're saying, but uh, I, I, I'm just going to move on. <laughs> uh, A24 is not the savior of cinema. Saving cinema as a whole requires unionization, democratization, and or the socialization of the workplace. Bottom up, not top down. I'll give you that A24 is not the sole savior, but it takes, I think, even more than what you've suggested. I think it just takes executives realizing they're spending too much on movies, which in turn creates movie ticket prices being more expensive. And every study shows everyone loves going to the movies. It's just too fucking expensive. Guess what the number one, other than Christmas Day, because Christmas Day is the biggest movie day of the year, the number one movie day of the year is uh, that the one day of the year where all tickets are $5. Tuesdays. Yeah, well, well like, oh, there, there's, like, a yeah. special day where it's, like, even $3. Oh, okay. Everybody fucking goes. Yeah. Record numbers. It doesn't matter what's in theaters. People want to go. Mm-hmm. Shit's just getting expensive. 
and that's you know well, i mean it's like you said too just about the the budgets on these movies yeah i think as it stands right now one of the most profitable films is tarot yeah which what had an eight million dollar budget yeah. is like roughly 50. 50 yeah you know and all critics accounts and reception it's not good but you know your movie can make a profit yeah just don't overspend exactly and uh lastly here uh, Friday the 13th is the most over-celebrated horror franchise. Yes, I agree. I agree emphatically. If you've watched the show for any number of years, you know that's how I feel. Nicholas, tell me I'm wrong. Jason Takes Manhattan's great. <laughs> that's, that's my take. That's my hot take. Jason X is great. I'll give you that. Mm-hmm. I refuse to call it Jason 10. Anyone who calls it Jason 10 just doesn't know the tone of that movie. Like Fast X. Yes. It's not Fast 10. Which should have been Fast 10. In your seatbelts, 100%. Yeah. But um, thank you, Snarky McCarthy. And anyone else, if you have movie hot takes that you want us to read on the show, leave them in the comments or on the next community post whenever we post them next week. And uh, Nicholas, I believe we also wanted to look at the polls. Yeah, you know, we've been posting a, a number of polls in the community post, which everyone has been engaging with. So thank you for that and keep it up as well. But we never really go back and like comment on them. Yeah. So I thought it might be fun to take a look at that from the past week. All right, so the first poll we did was, do you think Deadpool and Wolverine director Sean Levy is a good choice to direct the next Avengers movie? And this is coming off the heels of the news we reported last week that uh-huh. Sean Levy was a top choice. So uh, our choices were absolutely, good but safe, no, and then X person should direct, comment below. Uh, so taking the cake was good but safe with 71% of the votes, with a total of 400 votes as well on that. Yeah. Uh, there we go. We Thanks did for voting, guys. We did get some comments to some other directors. Someone said, "Yeah, it's a good choice," but Scorsese would be my first pick with a winky face. Uh, and then a Morgan Campbell uh, <laughs> said, "I would be happy if he was chosen as director, but I would love to see parentheses joke answer Edgar Wright's Avengers, real answer George Miller's Avengers, really real answer Greta Gerwig's Avengers." Morgan Campbell, wonder who that is. I wonder who that could be. <laughs> Uh, George Miller's Avengers is quite good, but I still want to see his Justice League movie. Yes, which never happened. Personally. Um, next poll coming out was actually uh, something that was based off of uh, Snarky McCarthy's, uh, one of his hot takes last week, where he said best horror franchise. So we put that in the polls here. Evil Dead, Scream, Halloween, and other comment below. Uh, this one had 233 votes, with yeah. Evil Dead taking it at 55%, mm-hmm. all closely by Scream at 28%. Groovy. Good for good for the evil dead here. Uh, and finally, how are you feeling about finally seeing Inside Out 2 this week after nine long years? This one only 40 votes, but we had Joy, Sad, Anxious, other comment below, and Joy took it at 59%. That's pretty good. good. Followed by Anxious at 36%. Sure. But I don't think you need to be anxious about it. It's quite a good movie, and if you haven't yes. done so already, check out the review we posted on the channel. I enjoyed it as well. Mm-hmm. And because uh, clearly, what what goes on in our polls with less than five thousand subscribers is what's true of the entire industry as a whole. Correct. Yes. 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 I'm, I'm glad we're on the same page. Yeah. So <laughs> with that down, guys, let's move on to our first uh, news topic story of today. And Nicholas, what do you got for us first? Our first news story comes to us from the Hollywood Reporter, and that is that Miles Teller is set to star in an officer and a gentleman remake for paramount and a gentleman (laughs) (laughs) yes so uh yeah this is exciting news because uh, an officer and a gentleman was kind of the star making performance for richard Gere, i believe who was in the original film and i know that my mom loves that movie i've seen i've never seen the whole thing start to finish but it was on often so like i know certain iconography and like visuals where as soon as i see it i'm like oh that's officer and a gentleman like i just remember from seeing it moms love miles teller so here we go yes they do (laughs) the moms that are our age now love miles teller and uh look i think this is a really good choice um the hollywood reporter doesn't give too much details it just kind of goes on to say that um you know miles teller is going to be starring in it and it's going to be there's no director yet i don't think but they do have a writer and uh it also is a um it's going to be written by uh dana fox and matt johnson so, listen, this is exciting. Uh, I think it's uh, one of those movies that's ripe for a remake. And, um, you know, it's one that holds a place in people's hearts, but it's also not so overly beloved that it's going to cause shit when it gets announced, hence from the announcement, nothing but really positive news coming from it. Mm-hmm. Um, it is an interesting choice. I wonder what the direction that they're going to take, and I wonder if the people who have that spot for the original will go see it. Definitely all the Top Gun Maverick fans, because Miles Taylor was very good in that. Mm-hmm. And as someone who graduated from the same high school as him, nice to see an alumni take on more iconic roles. Nicholas, what are your thoughts? 
I have never seen the original. What is it a rom romance romance movie? Is it a drama? Is it is it like a romance drama. Yes, romance drama. Mm-hmm. Okay, cool. <laughs> I've never seen it, so I don't really sure. Yeah, you know. Yeah. Uh, actually, something more interesting from the article that caught my eye was that he next stars with Anya Taylor Joy mm-hmm. in The Gorge, a romantic Scott action Derrickson. thriller by Scott Derrickson. Hell yeah! Which will release later this year. Hell yeah! Uh, now that piques my interest. Oh yeah, I'm but excited about that. Listen, he Miles Teller, you know, he had a, uh, some some hits and misses here. Fantastic Four, um, but you know, I think Top Gun Maverick really just brought him to that next level. I mean, look at Glenn Powell's just yeah everywhere now. Um, and listen, Miles Teller's always been a great actor. Yes, e- even in the projects that weren't necessarily great, it was never him. No, but I mean, then you watch Whiplash and you're like, oh, he's good. Yeah, yeah, you know? 100%. So, uh, I think it's a very exciting thing. No, I agree. I agree. I'm excited for this. What do you guys think about Miles Teller starring in the remake of An Officer and a Gentleman? Let us know in the comments as we move on to our next story. And Nicholas, what do you got for us next? Oh, do I have a story? <laughs> our next story comes to us from The Wrap, and that is that Marvel's Blade has now lost yet another director. Wah, wah. Jan Damage has left the project. Yes, and uh, apparently there's a lot of stuff to unwrap here. Um, and it's from The Wrap, so pun kind of intended. But um, basically, kind of summarizing it, in this article it talks about how um, Jan Demange is no longer a part of Blade, but that that happened months ago. So they've been looking for a new director for a while, which then led to speculation that, oh, Jordan Peele met with Marvel recently. Is it going to be about that? Which got people excited. But then you kind of found out, no, it was kind of early talks about X-Men, and Peele said he wasn't interested. So then that kind of just went away. But people are obviously getting their hopes up, trying to figure out who should direct this Blade film, if this Blade film's even going to happen, if Herschel Ali will even stay on as Blade. And then you have the Daniel RPK of it all. For those that don't know, Daniel RPK is a a movie-related scooper who is fairly accurate. Uh, He's one of the more reliable ones. And uh, he had mentioned in one of his Patreon posts that while it looks like the movie is just kind of slappishly getting put together because that's what it seems like from all the writers they've lost the two directors they've now lost apparently the most recent script that eric pearson did they're still using michael green's story eric pearson just did like another draft of that script and eric pearson has kind of been the guy at marvel to take projects across the finish line he's done that with several scripts Mm -hmm. uh i think black widow he is one he did most recently he may have done one of the thor films as well but he's known for doing that so him coming on as a writer is not all that much of a red flag It might might even just be some universe ties that they're doing. Who knows? But um, they are still looking for a director. There's no way they're going to hit their 2025 release date. That's going to get pushed. 100%. This movie was, what, 2019 it was announced? Yeah. It's crazy. Yeah. I was in the room. You were in the room where it happened. Yeah. Nice. But um, it's a Hamilton quote. The room where it happened? No? Mm. We have accidental theater references in here. I know know what I'm doing. (laughs) But uh, but yeah, listen. But but according to RPK, going back to that, apparently like everything's on track. They just need a new director who's gonna like do this script. They basically need a shooter, like someone who's just gonna come in and be like, okay, I'll do this, and go for it. Um, rumors, well, not rumors. Let me clarify. Back in January of this year, yeah, uh, Chad Stileski was quoted saying, "Oh, I'd love to do Blade. Why haven't they called him? <laughs> That's I my question." He'd want to do like his own fair script probably but right? i think all they gotta tell him is hey you can make it r-rated and then that's fine that'd be enough for me personally and he's probably ready to go yeah but but what are your thoughts on all the, the whole blade drama and w- what do you think is even going on at this point i mean it's a super i'm not gonna say super low budget it's low budget for marvel based on the rumors mm-hmm. right that they're shooting for like what 50 to 80 yeah you know, which is significantly less than a lot of their projects, even cheaper than their TV shows. Yeah. You've gone through several writers. You've gone through several directors. You know, I just, is is the issue they can't crack the story? Or is it that they're trying to make it perfect and take their time and they're going to put in the time it takes to make it perfect? You know, it it is a dude with swords <laughs> that fights vampires. Yeah. To me, it seems like it shouldn't be that hard, but that they're really, you know, I I think, and there's been a lot of rumors that they're pushing for uh, a Midnight Suns project, which I imagine Blade would spearhead. Uh So there could be them trying to crack that and incorporate that into the story, whereas they could just make a Blade movie. Yeah, I agree. And call it a day. Uh, Did you see Wesley Snipes 
tweet about it. I did so hear about this, yeah. The OG Blade, my Blade, cut out and said, Blade on uh, on X, Blade, lordy, 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 folks still looking for the secret sauce, riding snowmobiles in traffic, kind of rough. Daywalkers make it look easy, don't they? Some motherfucker's always trying to ice skate uphill. Some motherfucker's <laughs> always trying to... <laughs> what, what is the guy, what does he say when he gets shot? He's like, He's like, are you out of your fucking mind? Are you mind? out of your fucking mind? <laughs> no, I mean, you have a talent in Mahershala Ali, mm-hmm. who is a great casting for Blade. Yeah. What's going on? Like, why, why, why all the troubles? Honestly, fucking... Uh, Chad Stileski, great. I'd love to see that from an original script from him, too, mm-hmm. in his work there. If you need someone to just come in and shoot it, give it to um, uh, uh, David Leach. Yeah. Call it a day. Bullet Train, Fall Guy, both very fun movies. And he needs a hit. And he needs a hit. Yeah. Fucking just let him get Blade. I I'd think like he'd that. do. I think he'd do a great job. Me as well. And, and also, um, my whole thing, too, is I think this is just an example of Kevin Feige being stretched too thin. Mm-hmm. He's got two Avengers movies to worry about and a Deadpool movie that has to be successful. And so every time he's like, let's check on Blade. And he goes back and he's like, guys, what the fuck? <laughs> and has to look. Like, he has like swords him. and fights <laughs> vampires. vampires. It's oh. not that difficult. Yeah, and I feel like, because I know that they fired one person who was working on Blade already, yeah. like an executive, because they were doing such a bad job in the beginning. Um, I feel like it also just might be a thing of like Kevin Feige, what, what he did with Daredevil, where he just came in and was like, nope, do it again. Yeah. And that's probably happened just a couple times now. And honestly, because people, the, the now the question is, is Mahershala Ali going to leave? I think that all depends on why these changes are happening. If Mahershala Ali has liked the past three scripts and they keep changing, he might leave. Yeah. However, if he's the one texting Kevin Feige saying, hey, I don't like where this is going. This ain't it. Hey, this yeah. ain't it. Then he's going to stay. And uh, according to Jeff Snyder, our favorite drama person, mm-hmm. um, he said that um, Jan Damaj was let go. Okay. Because he was just being difficult to work with, according to Jeff Snyder. Yeah. So if that's the case, then I'm sure Marshall Ali is fine with this, you know, so. I, I, what I'm curious about, and going all the way back to the announcement in 2019, right, is what also is Marshall Ali's involvement in this? You know, is he the one kind of causing all these issues because he wants it to be perfect? Because when he was introduced, Kevin Feige said, when Marshall Ali comes to you and says he wants to be Blade, you let him be Blade. Yeah. So, you know, was that, you know, was that just PR and press? Or, like, do you no, think that, I, I think that Mahershali I, approached him with it and now he's really kind of involved in it? No, I think so. I think, I think he'll be listed as an EP on the movie. That's what, yeah. So, you know, is he the one sort of, like, it needs to be perfect? Yeah, probably. It wouldn't shock me. And, and I think that them letting him do this new Jurassic World movie is a sign of good faith, I think, yeah. of just, like, hey, we're not going to keep your schedule. Go do that. We'll be right here. We'll be ready for you. And I think that's kind of a, an olive branch, if you will. Because what's sort of been. Because what causes a lot of around, actors yeah. to leave is not being able to do other stuff. Mm-hmm. So they're like, no, go make your money. Come right back. We'll be here. I think that was a sign of good faith from Marvel to him. Mm-hmm. But anyway, we've gone on a lot about this. What do you guys think about Blade losing another director? Do you think this movie is even going to happen? Do you think Mahershala Ali will stay or leave? Let us know in the comments as we move on to our next story. And Nicholas, what do you got for us next? Our next story comes to us from Deadline. Is that And that is that Emily Blunt is circling Steven Spielberg's next summer temple at Amblin and Universal. Yes, so... Steven Spielberg is making a summer movie again, mm-hmm. coming out in July, and all we know about it is that it involves UFOs. Mm-hmm. We don't know anything else. <laughs> and he, they've now cast their first person in Emily Blunt. Now, this comes as no surprise, because one, Emily Blunt fucking rules, first of all, let's establish that. Two, she's just coming off an Oscar nomination for Christopher Nolan. There's nowhere really to go but up, and where's up? Spielberg, probably. Yeah. A Spielberg summer movie. Hell yeah. Banana bread at work. You know, I... Banana bread at work. Have you not seen that video? No. Oh, there's... Sorry. There's a video of a guy who's just thrilled that he had banana bread at work, and he keeps saying, like, banana bread at work, dude. Hell yeah. And he just keeps going. It's amazing. I'll show you later. All right. But, um... Look. All you need to tell me Steven Spielberg's making a movie, I'm in. Mm -hmm. It's in the summer. I'm double in. UFOs. Triple in. Emily Blunt. Where do I sign? Where do I sign inject this movie into my veins Mm -hmm. what are your thoughts yeah i listen emily blunt is a fantastic actress i think fall guy was a little bit i enjoyed fall guy but it might have been a little bit of a miscalculation there uh 
on it, but you know, if you look at her past, right, she's coming off of Oppenheimer. Now, if this was her follow up to Oppenheimer, ooh, you know, very excited. But I mean, if you look at the rotation of what she's worked with, right, you have Nolan, Denis Villeneuve, Rob Marshall, Doug Liman, Ryan Johnson, now Spielberg. You know, she's and 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 in terms of in terms of box office, while the Fall Guy did flop, like Quiet Place, both of them did great. Exactly, and even if you look at who she attaches herself to talent wise, you know, say what you will about The Rock. He's a insane producer, not necessarily good or bad, but man, he he gets shit made. Yeah, uh, it might take a few decades, like Black Adam, but you know, and he just signed the first look picture deal with Disney, and they had a pretty successful movie in Jungle Cruise, so you know that's ripe for a sequel there. So she's she's got work lined up. Yeah, I wouldn't be surprised if we go back and get another Quiet Place after with her. Um, and oh, she just has, she's doing um the Benny Safdie movie. Yes, with The Rock actually, which is seems like a drama that everyone's taking. You know, so it, it, she 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 knows how to she knows how to pick her projects. Mm-hmm. I think is is what I'm trying to say. Yeah, no, hundred percent. And look, I think this this movie has nowhere to go but down. So hopefully, it just kicks all the ass that we hope it will. And it says here it's described as a two hander, so they uh, they still need a, another another lead to cast. So it'll yeah. be interesting who they go with that. Oh, I'm I'm excited. I can't wait. Again, inject this movie into my veins. Let's fucking go. I think this is the definition of let's fucking go. Well, now here's my here's my 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 thing, right? Mm-hmm. We had a pretty good UFO movie a few years ago. Yeah, with Nope. With Nope. Mm-hmm. So I I am curious to see because that was such a a unique take on a UFO movie. Yes. So I'd be curious to Steve Spielberg go a little more classic, or is there some sort of other new element to it that he introduces? Yeah, I'd be curious too. I don't think it's a legacy sequel. Like I've seen some people say, like, "Oh, is it Close Encounters two or is it ET 2? I doubt it. Mm-hmm. Why hide that? Like I feel like the that's... Green Planet. <laughs> Give it to me. <laughs> yes, but uh, but no, I do think it'll be an original, and I this, it does excite me because because I feel like this is Spielberg kind of cooking, and I feel like he's he's like I need to remind people that like. I'm back, you know, mm-hmm. so we'll, we'll see what happens. What do you guys think of Emily Blunt joining the new Steven Spielberg film? And are you excited for it? Listen, let us know in the comments as we move on to our final news topic story of the day. And Nicholas, what do you got for us? Our last story comes to us from The Hollywood Reporter. And that is that Sony Pictures has acquired the Alamo Drafthouse Cinema in a landmark deal which puts studios back in the theater game. Tons of stuff to break down from this. Oh, yeah. First of all, um, I covered extensively during the pandemic when uh, the Paramount decrees were overturned. Mm-hmm. And a lot of people kind of like, oh, that's weird, because movie theaters way back in the day, they used to own movie theaters, and they, there was a worry of a monopoly, because they would do stuff like block booking, where they would make theaters book several different films if they wanted a big film. And then so, you know, the government stepped in and said, hey, movie studios can't own theaters. Mm-hmm. Illegal. No. Then in the pandemic, they undid that. A lot of people were like, oh, is this going to be bad like a Monopoly again? And my take on it at the time is still kind of my take now of like being on the inside of a movie theater and seeing how they operate. They're barely profitable yeah. every single year. And that was before the pandemic. Afterwards, who fucking knows? Some shut down entirely. Mm-hmm. And so when people ask like, oh, do you think this is going to cause a lot of mo- movie like studios to buy theaters all of a sudden? I was like, no, I would not want to. That would be such a bad idea for, you know, financially. And uh, a lot of the concern there was kind of subsidized. Like, monopolies aren't going to be a problem because no interest in buying the theaters. And that was also at the same time when we saw a lot of people shift into trying to get into the streaming game. That's when the HBO Max uh, day and date release debacle happened. I'm going to have to make the documentary about the corporate film of streaming. It's the most fascinating bullshit I've ever experienced. But regardless, something that we've always known about Sony, with the exception of Crunchyroll, they are not about streaming services. No. They don't want it. They don't want to get involved with it. They like the old school way of having people pay them for their content and playing it. They love that. And they've talked about being committed to the theatrical game, you know, the old school way of making films and distributing films. How committed are they? They just purchased the Alamo Draft House. Now you said, you might be thinking, Dalton, you just said that it'd be a bad idea to kind of buy these big theater chains. Yes, but Alamo Draft House is not AMC. It's not regal it's not cinemark Uh it is a relatively popular but smaller chain in the texas area that goes into california i think there's like 30 or 50 locations something like that we were actually supposed to get one in orlando but the pandemic ruined that 36 yeah 
But here's the thing about Alamo Drafthouse. Not only are they relatively nice theaters, they are small enough to where Sony can now incentivize people to go to these theaters and make money for them. One. Two, any money made by the theater with a Sony film, there's no split. It's all Sony's money. Yeah. So that kind of eliminates that problem that people have with box office and theater intake anyway. Three, they're not just going to exclusively play Sony movies. That would be stupid. They're going to play other films, and now they can probably make deals on the back end of every movie that plays at the Alamo Draft House. some of it goes to Sony. <laughs> yeah. It's a very interesting move. So Warner Brothers has to pay Sony yes, to play their movies. exactly. Now, a lot of you are thinking, like, well, why would a movie theater do that? It's only 30 theaters. Yeah. It's not a big deal on that end. But two, imagine... Imagine if at the Alamo Draft House, when Spider-Man 4 comes out, owned by Sony, they say, hey, that movie opens on July 4th. At the Alamo Draft House, you can see it July 1st. Mm -hmm. And only at the Alamo Draft House. Genius marketing idea. Mm -hmm. And they own it. They can do whatever they want. They and you can, you can do stuff like that for all of their films. You can re-release random Sony movies and see be like... early at the theater, at the Draft House. Exactly. Like and that's just an idea, and like, they get guaranteed the the the, the top prime slots all for, the money. for their movies. Yes, one hundred percent. I think this is a very smart move by Sony. Mm -hmm. Is it going to be profitable right away? Probably not, but it's only thirty six theaters. You can offer great incentives. You are going to take make money from other distribution companies as well, and it's not such a big commitment that you're going to drown because you're not buying Regal AMC. Mm -hmm. And this shows proof of their commitment to the theatrical model. Sony has slowly becoming my favorite movie studio. And I can't believe I'm saying that because they fuck up a lot. <laughs> they do. Because, hey, it was Paramount. Paramount's going to be gone. Yeah. But listen, I'm fascinated by this. They even tried to buy Paramount. Yes. And by the way, quick side tangent. We didn't do a story out of it because it would take too much time. The deal with Skydance fell through. Paramount's still for sale. <laughs> Let's do it. How much do okay, they need? Let's do it. How much for Paramount? How much Come for on, Paramount? be honest. <laughs> I'm I have negative ten thousand dollars. Two deals fell through. Give it to us. Twenty dollars. <laughs> yeah, but but anyway, uh, what are your thoughts on Sony acquiring the Alamo Draft House? Do you think this could be a good thing? Uh, going kind of just agreeing with what you said. I, I think it shows the commitment to the theatrical experience. Uh, it gives them great incentive, gives people incentive to go to the Alamo, especially like you said in an example, right? See Spider-Man 4 a few days early. Those theaters are book solid, mm -hmm. hands down. And, you know, it's big enough where people know Alamo Draft House because they have the shushers, right? Like they have, yeah. the, like, you know, it, it is the oh, theatrical Oh, zero experience. tolerance cell phone you policy. Know, you have that. You can have them, you know, upgrading these theaters as well, even just, you know, better screens, better projection. Uh, I'm sure every speaker is going to be Sony now. Mm -hmm. um, and it, it, it's big enough where you can even expand it just a little more. And it's really like, you know, they're never going to reach the 2,000 oh, no. screen, you know, theaters, whatever that. But you can hit every major market. Like, you can put one in... I don't know where they're at right now, so yeah. this could be, you know, ignorance. But, like, you can put one in Chicago, in yeah. Cincinnati, in Orlando, in fucking Louisville. Like, I don't know, like, like you wherever, like... That 36, you could do, like, each major city. Like, 100 you know? is attainable still, yeah. and it's still not anywhere near where And it's still not considered anything. wide theatrical at all. Exactly. Yeah. So, I, I think it's a great move. Um, especially if they don't change, you know, a whole lot, you know, because I think mm -hmm. the, the what people love about the Alamo Draft House is... The commitment to the theatrical experience, the zero tolerance for issues and everything. So I think if they keep that up and, you know, even to just improve it, I think it's a great choice. And I wonder if it's incredibly successful if other movie theater chains will try to follow it with those smaller chains, like a Sinopolis or any other theater chain. And then you'll have Disney, who one day will just be like, "We fucking bought AMC." <laughs> AMC is ours. <laughs> but uh, but well, yeah. I'd be curious too. I don't know how it works, like with. So, like, just here in Orlando, right, Disney has an AMC, mm -hmm. uh, Universal CityWalk has a Cinemark. Are those owned by them, or are they just essentially leasing property? Leasing property, because okay. the the, Cinem the CityWalk one used to be AMC. Oh, okay, I didn't know mm -hmm. that. Yeah. I worked at the other, I don't give a fuck, I worked at the other Cinemark mm -hmm. when that one became Cinemark, and it was, like, a whole thing. Like, you had to fight, like, who wants to go work for that one? And it was, like, a whole... Well, because you used to get like the universal benefits, right? Because it's on property. You still do if you work there. Oh, you still do. Oh, yeah. shit. Mm -hmm. That's pretty good. Yeah, it's very good. So they don't own it, but 
since it's on their property, yeah. they have to give. The Let's say Disney yeah. buys AMC. That AMC is gone. You think? Yes. Do you think the AMC at Disney Springs stays if Regal bought um, AMC? Or I'm sorry, if like Universal bought AMC? Oh, you said Disney, if Disney buys AMC. No, no, I'm saying if Disney were to buy, oh, I'm sorry, Cinemark. If Disney were to buy Cinemark, the one at Universal is gone. Oh, yeah, and then the AMC at Disney Springs becomes Cinemark. Yeah. 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 Okay, I I follow what you said, yeah. Yeah. Uh, But yeah, listen, tons of interesting stuff regarding this. It could be a whole mess or it could be fantastic. So let us guy, let us know what you guys think about Sony buying the Alamo Draft House as we move on to the box office. The box office. So we're a little bit early, but I do have Deadline pulled up to kind of help us with these box office. Uh, Nicholas, do you want to pull up our predictions from last week? Sure thing. All right, Dalton, you had Inside Out 2, Bad Boys, Garfield, If... Kingdom of the Planet of the Apes. I had Inside Out, Bad Boys, Garfield, If, Kingdom of the Planet of the Apes. We had the same exact guess. That's right. And we were both... We were both wrong. Yep. However, they are all in the top five. Oh. We got the order incorrect. Go on. Which is... I like I like this top five, I must say. <laughs> so... Like just them all being in the top five or the specific order? The specific order. Okay. So, uh, this is actually pretty awesome. So... Coming in first, Inside Out 2, obviously, making, it's projected between 140 and 150. Holy shit. That's good. Damn. That is good. We're so back. (laughs) Insert the we're so back memes for the box office. Uh, Coming in second was Bad Boys Ride or Die, making uh, $31.5 million, a 60% drop. Uh, coming in third, Kingdom of the Planet of the Apes, oh. making a another five point four million dollars on only ten percent drop from last week. Holy shit! Yeah, coming in fourth was Garfield, making another five point three million dollars, uh, dropping forty seven percent from week three to week four. And coming in fifth, If sticking in the top five, making a, another uh, three point six million dollars. Uh, Watchers fell out of the top five and pl- went in sixth place, making another. Uh, 3.4 million. Furiosa in seventh, making another 2.4 million. So, holy shit, inside out. Yeah. Thank you for saving the Clearing. movie theaters right for right now. And also, while we're talking about box office, did you fucking see the projections for Deadpool and Wolverine? What did we got? My brother in Christ. The conservative estimate is 200 million, <laughs> which would be the biggest opening weekend for an R rated movie ever. Certainly something Marvel needs to. Yeah, and listen, the article does point out, like the deadline article where I got that, where it's like, hey, one, are there going to be people who don't realize it's rated R? Yes. But even if we were off by 30%, which has never happened, you're still at over 150. That's <laughs> so crazy. It's like, that's a great opening. It's so a really good opening. Yeah, so I'm, I'm sure they're enthusiastically pleased over there. And by the way, the numbers is now updated. They're saying Inside Out's at 155. <laughs> Holy shit! God damn. So yeah, and uh, that was made on a budget of 200, 200. So it does have some room to go, but I think it'll make that no problem. Um, Bad Boys Great. Ride or Die worldwide now has 160 on a budget of 100. It's at 1.6. I think it'll squeak its way to profitability within the next few weeks. Kingdom of the Planet of the Apes is now at 362 on a budget of 160. It's at 2.3. Come on, Planet of the Apes. <laughs> You're right there. Um, Garfield now has $200 million worldwide on a budget of 60 Profitability, no problem for Garfield. And If is now at 173 worldwide on a budget of 110 It's at 1.6. I think it'll come just below profitability, but it'll be much better than that opening weekend suggested. So I'm sure they're happy about that. Pure Furiosa, man. It's not even at 150 Damn. It's not even gonna. It might barely make its production budget back, which sucks. It wasn't a bad movie though. I love that. I love it. I know you thought it was good. Mm-hmm. But I, I love it. Um, that's a shame. That is a real shame. Um, do you want to do predictions for next week? Yeah. What do we have? Bike bike riders. That's it. Let Let's check because this has bitten us before. Mm-hmm. Was if number five? Yes. This week. According to Deadline. Okay. Uh, the Watchers could sneak past and be number five, depending on yes. the estimates. Okay. But we'll see. Right. By the way, I saw The Watchers. How was it? Not good. This is the M. Night Shyamalan's daughter? Yep. Mm. 
There's an indie film called Thelma coming out, an indie film called Ghost Light coming out. I am Celine Dion. The Exorcism comes out this weekend. Oh, shit. We have to go see that. Absolutely. Uh, as a do. sidebar. Uh, but yeah, I think Bike Riders is the only one that's going to do business, probably. All right. All right, I think I have my predictions. Go for it. All right, I'm going Inside Out 2, keeping number one. Of course. I'm going to go Bad Boys, keeping number two. Okay. Then I'm going to go Bike Riders. I'm going to go The Exorcism. And I'm going to go Kingdom of the Planet of the Apes. Wild, dude. I'm going to go completely different from you. Go on. Inside Out, number one. Bike Riders, number two. Bad Boys, number three. Apes number four. Garfield number five. Ooh, you don't think exorcism's even gonna crack it? No. Not enough marketing. Horror. It, it, it is horror. And I, I realize what I'm doing. But I don't think it's been marketed at all. I feel like bike riders hasn't been marketed. I've seen a big push recently. I feel like I've genuinely seen the trailer once. <laughs> and it was sent to me. Yeah. You know, like, mm-hmm. I don't even, genuinely don't know what it's about, and I'm just going to see if I can ride that into the theater. Yeah, when I saw um, Watchers the yesterday, mm-hmm. I saw a Bike Riders trailer, and there was, like, a Bike Riders pre-show ad. Oh. So I think they're really ramping up. How's it look? Out. Does it look good? It looks fine. Yeah. The acting looks good. I mean, it's got Tom Hardy and Austin Butler and... Um, Doing an accent off. Tom Hardy's is crazier than Austin Butler's. It always will be. And, uh, oh my gosh, Last Duel. Jodie Comer. Yes. It's a good cast. Great cast. I'm, I'm in. I, I think I said when we were deciding on the movies, I was like, I'm down to go see whatever Austin Butler's accent, yeah. whatever accent he's going to pull out. Precisely, precisely. So I'll check it out. Plus, has Norman Reedus in, like, makeup. Yeah. Like, VF, like, yeah, uh... I saw that. Yeah, I'm down for it. Yeah, same, same. So, that's the box office. That's the predictions. Uh, these are the Sunday estimates. We'll put the Monday finals in the description below. Um, if you want to predict the box office yourself, please leave it in the comments. And if you're right, we'll shout you out on the show. Anything else you want to add, the good sir? Uh, as always, you can find links to our social media as well as the audio only version of the show in the description below. We'll post the Monday box office numbers in the description. If you haven't already, check out our review of Inside Out 2 on the channel. I don't think we have anything this week. I don't think so. Uh, there will be a review for the finale of Doctor Who. Yes. And maybe a review, maybe an out of theater for bike riders, depending maybe. on we'll see. depending on how we feel about it. Yep. Well, you won't be there. No. Well, for bike riders, I'll be here. Oh, cool. Well, there we go. Mm-hmm. I won't be here for Quiet Place. That's what I was thinking of. Yeah. Flipped it. Gotcha. Yeah. We'll see. We'll yeah. see. We'll see how we feel about bike riders. Yeah. Well, with that down, guys, thank you so much for watching, and we'll see you on the next one.